This is Top Gear. In my opinion, this is the very best of the racing games. It beats F Zero into the ground. Now, as you can see, the classic Andy Peters. Weirdly enough, there was a time when I was probably more excited about seeing my favourite hobby on the telly than I was to actually partake in the hobby itself. I'm talking about the dreadful, but good if you were there, computing and gaming TV programmes of Great Britain. Sometimes boring. At the British Waterways headquarters in Rickmansworth. Sometimes funny. Don't film my nuts. Oftentimes cringe inducing. Which I will now do. Um. But always unmissable television. Let's take a look back at the many shows that would try their very best to bring the art of the video games and the complexity of home computers to the small screen. The word internet is linked with words and expressions like information superhighway and cyberspace and I'm confused. It's easy to forget just how recent the micro-revolution is. Only a decade or so ago, most computers lived behind locked doors and were used only by highly trained specialist staff. Nowadays, it seems, they're everywhere. I was born in 1986, so although few on the ground, there were already computer shows that I would miss due to the fact that I was still living in my previous life. With this in mind, I will go over just a few that I have actually watched. Since computers in the 1980s were still a new trend, most people at home would either have no idea what a computer is capable of, or they are on the lookout for tips on what computers to buy so they could join in and make their lives easier. Because of this, computer-based television of the 80s often had a whiff of a sales pitch to them, but mainly consisted of uncool types sitting around in suits, trying to explain to us computer illiterate plebs at home what computers are available to us, and which ones do what for what purpose. Take this episode of the computer program for example from 1982 that uses the analogy of cooking to explain how a computer program is able to sequence certain tasks. It can test whether a condition is true or false and as a result of that test it can do either one set of instructions or a different set of instructions. It's beginning to sound a little bit like cooking in that there only are a very limited number of processes you can inflict on a, on a set of ingredients. You can boil, bake or roast or fry them and a limited number of ingredients you can do it with, of course. But by combining the instructions in different ways, there's no limit to the number of dishes you can make. This show also shows us a wonderful young lady who takes to computers like a fish to water. I love this old lady. She not only bats away the reporter's quite condescending questioning. So you actually had the computer here, and yes. you had that keyboard and the blank screen facing you. Weren't you rather apprehensive? No. <laughs> You knew what to do already, did you? Well, uh, I mean, it looked like a typewriter, didn't it? And I could operate a typewriter, and I was fascinated by the little bits that came up on the screen in front of me. But also, she uses her state-of-the-art computer to run a side business to help other local shops with the paperwork. Seriously, my mum, even today, refuses to use Google on a tablet. I can only imagine how she would have reacted to a computer running something like BASIC back in the 80s. Do you see, do you think, the computer side of your business ever taking over from the chocolates? I hope so. Yes, it'd be great fun, because uh, at the present time, the chocolate, uh, this business, is um, sort of going down because we've got a new bypass and it's uh, affected trade. Nothing more British than someone complaining about that goddamn bypass. Over on four computer buffs now, we possibly have the first ever unboxing video. First of all, the BBC. There's the machine, the keyboard and control unit, and in the box, a user guide and a welcome pack. The QL provides a little more. Full Computer Bus was certainly aimed at the more computer savvy types out there. Watching this with hardly any computer experience would have been a total nightmare. An example of this is in the first episode where lovely chappy Dr. Mike Fawn showed us how to put together a device that you can use to receive software from the show using this little blob of light. Well, the first thing is to cut yourself a piece of Vero board of the right size and then mount the integrated circuit holder. A re-triggerable mono stable, which is a bit of a mouthful. If you don't get it in the right way round, then because it's of the electrolytic type, it'll probably blow up. My thanks for all your help, chaps. 
Now, if you didn't get that all in one go, don't worry, because on page 184 of the March edition of Personal Computer World is a very large article explaining exactly how to build all that hardware. OK, so I can read a Bible's worth of text in a magazine to help me instead. Before Computer Bus wasn't the only program that took to sharing out software via our TV sets, however. The show database would wisely use their credits time to play out some software via audio, which you could then record and play using your home computer. Why didn't this catch on more? I guess it's kind of a predecessor to those QR codes that were all the rage a few years back. Hey, remember when people were throwing around the idea of putting those codes on a gravestone and you know, when you look at the code it would link to a video of that person dancing around happy and alive? Why didn't that take off? Database is also home to two of my favourite moments in any computer show of this era. The first is during a segment about home computing in the Japanese market. The ever entertaining Tony Bastable interviews a man named Pete Perkins, who has not only copied the Apple II home computer, but he also doesn't give two dams about any laws that he may be breaking. Is it illegal what you're doing? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Well, I haven't got caught at it yet. I see. And you're doing the same thing with the IBM PC, yes? OK, that's not completely true. He doesn't so much not care as he's just completely ignorant to any laws. I love this guy. And secondly, the beautiful Jane Ashton gives a short but terribly awkward interview to Pat Green and Jermaine Cla I mean, uh, Julian, about connecting to the internet via a modem. I can then switch on the modem and we're ready to go. Um, the computer's asking me if I want to log on and it's now telling me to phone up the main press cell computer, which I will now do. Um, so it's a very simple connection to make. Extremely simple. Um, and I can actually leave the modem pl plugged in once it's done that without affecting the telephone. I'm now waiting for the computer to answer me. It's quite interesting to see the old Prestel database pages, but my god, listening and watching these two interact with Jane just hurts. Well, thank you very much, Pat and Julian. We'll be seeing you later in the program. Bye, Bye Jane. Jane. If you have any this is making the most of the micro and micro live. Both probably the most remembered computer shows of the time, but they can be so slow. I've got a, I've got a letter here from a man who says he would like to hear a duet by Louis Armstrong and Earl Hines. All you know is that either Earl Hines or Louis Armstrong is on, you go to these artist cars. Now, OK, Louis Armstrong starts there, and they keep going, Armstrong, Armstrong. There's three and a half inches of solid cardboard there. Earl Hines about half of it. I happen to know that the duet he wants is called Weatherbird. Remember when you were young and you just wanted to watch your VHS tape of the Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles, but your parents insisted on watching the six o'clock news? Yeah, these shows give me flashback to those days. So in order to use the telephone, you pick up the telephone, is to get the telephone to dial 131 on the British Telecom line. One plus side to these shows, however, are the Running Man slash John Carpenter-esque theme tunes that they both had. <laughs> That is amazing. OK, OK, I'm being a little bit unfair here. Micro Live and making the most of the micro did have their great bits too. I'm sure I saw something I liked. Sean Walker, for example, comes into the Micro Live studios to show off his homemade piece of spy kit that allows him to see what is going on with any microcomputer by hijacking the radio signals. You are tuning the timings of this machine into the timings of the IBM micro over there. That's correct. Right, OK, well, here's the acid test. What is my password? Domino. Domino is correct. Let's see where it is. It's uh, just drifting off there the screen a bit. But if we compare that with the original screen... Ah, yes, there it is. There is my password. Domino. Very good reception. What's great about this particular segment is that they take this piece of kit onto the road to see if they can pull it off through the thick walls of London's buildings. Then they take it to a convention and hijack Epson's newly released PCAX screen and then confront the Epson spokesperson directly, which leaves him eating a big old piece of humble pie. 
Cypher's John Paisley, on the other hand, takes a much more defensive stance. We've actually been out and demonstrated this uh, in the street outside banks in the City of London. Don't you think they ought to know about this problem? Um, I think that's the bank's problem. I see, so it's not your problem that this it's computer not our problem, really. is emitting this sort of radiation? No. All, all terminals do the same. MicroLive wasn't the only program discussing some of the negatives about this new microcomputer boom though. In an episode of Equinox from 1986, we are shown that buying a computer is not all peaches and cream. The show, however, lacks some forward thinking and is a little hypocritical because on one hand it goes in length about how unfair it is that us normies don't know how to use the computers we're buying. Picked it up. A lot of manuals about this thing, and got it home, and um, it was all we could do to switch it on. We just didn't know what to do with the thing, and, and, and the manuals would take us a year to read. But then goes on to sneer at companies who set up learning seminars to help those who want to understand how their computers work. Computer consultants are springing up everywhere. Small ones, big ones, qualified, unqualified. They also go out of their way to point fingers at the companies for sucking up to the apparent elite in hopes of selling their goods. This bean feast is hosted by one of the largest computer companies in the world, Digital Equipment. The entry fee to this particular club is around half a million. Actually, he does look a bit sleepy. For that, you receive a cordial welcome, and for dessert, a bowl full of oh, sales John couched in the purest computerese. Of application software. And Digital, together with its third parties, can offer this software. Today, we'll be looking at two particular examples of decision support software. This program really is just a huge smear campaign against those new scary computers. They bring up some fairly good points. This machine, which in 1980 cost very close to half a million pounds to acquire the complete system, and it was then current technology. What do you think it's worth today? 50 pounds. Scrap value. But also, there is some huge nitpicking here. Telephones, the computers, if somebody digs a hole in the road and goes through the cable, we are in a lot of trouble. Yeah, but wouldn't a fire in a paper office do the same, if not more, damage? Caboodle could fall down because somebody sticks a needle through it. This show about how computers are ruining our lives is hosted, believe it or not, by Stephen Fry. Bull drivel. The guy who would go on to present Gadget Man, a show purposely made to throw shovelware electronics down our throats. It's for all the family. It uses an amazing wand, and it really is rather impressive. It's a game for PlayStation 3 that utilizes the Move system with its interactive wand and eye camera that reads the digital data on the page to produce a virtual image. Well, simply what's not to like? Oh, now it's on fire, so I have to put out the fire. Right, before we leave this era, there's one last thing I would like us to look at. It's a little bit cheeky as it appeared in a show in 1986, but the story is definitely of the era we're discussing. Hold on to your hats, because this is an odd one. So in 1996, there was a show called Out of This World, hosted by Countdown great Carol Vorderman. It was a show dedicated to covering the stories of the unusual. Big cats in Britain, haunted houses, spontaneous combustion, etc, etc. Well, there is one story on this show that blew my little brain wide open when I was a wee lad and actually terrified me at just the thought of it. The Haunted BBC Micro. Yeah, you heard that right. It was a story about a bloody BBC Micro that was haunted. In 1985, Ken and Debbie, no last name as they didn't want to appear in the program, received messages via their BBC microcomputer from the past and the future. It's quite an extensive story, so I won't go into detail right now, but if you're interested, stay until the end of the video and I'll go through the whole spooky story with you. One thing you may have noticed about this 80s era is that there's not much in these programs in terms of video games themselves. That's because back then, video games were still seen as a bit silly, and mainly for kids. We've put a uh, Jungle's Rainbow in, which uh, is a children's game, and it uh, teaches the child above and below. But uh, I set the thing up once, loaded the program, it went through onto the screen, and uh, I pressed the wrong button on the computer and we had to start again. Oh, here we are. It's just loaded up now. That's not to say that gaming wasn't touched upon at all, however. There was a fantastic episode of Commercial Breaks in 1984 which chronicled the highs and eventual lows of Imagine Software. This includes the moment when the team returned from their lunch breaks to find that they had been locked out of their office by the bailiffs. 
for now. We'll leave the room, please. Why? Why? Can you tell me Can you all get off that, please, okay. Michael? You will not. You will let go, please, Michael. Can you tell us what's happening? You'll get your foot off the door, please. Thank you. This episode of Commercial Breaks also showed us Ocean Software's preparation for the tough and competitive Christmas season. It's the biggest of the computer shows, and this is the last chance for the industry to exhibit ideas before Christmas. The new Hunchback is here too. In two months' time, it'll be launched onto its discerning young clients. And enough of the game has now been written for a sneak preview at Ocean's stand. If Hunchback is to make it to number one, the shops will have to sell 60,000 by January. <laughs> Remember when you could buy games in boots? Four Computer Bus would also feature possibly the first ever interview of a fresh-faced Richard and David Darling, the eventual founders of Codemasters. Micro Live would do what they do best, and rather than just review the adventure game The Pawn, they would use a more technical eye. Got a very sophisticated parser. A parser is the part of the program that understands what you type in. So as I said, it's not like video games were completely ignored in the 80s, they just weren't the focus. Okay, enough of this golden age of computing nonsense, and let's move on to the hip and happening 90s. Come on, Carl, chat back! So, for those of you who stayed, let's take a closer look at the story of the haunted BBC Micro. In 1984, Ken and Debbie came home one night to find a strange message on their screen, followed by the name Lucas. Ken, come here. How strangely you speak. Though I must confess that I've also been badly educated, you're a worthy man who has a fanciful woman, and you live in my house. Since your half-witted fool ripped my house apart, I've had trouble sleeping. It was a great shame that you stole my house. Ken! Lucas. When did you type this? I haven't touched it. Well, I certainly didn't. This is followed by strange noises and occurrences with furniture being balanced weirdly around the home. The next day, Ken and Debbie decide to try and make contact with this unknown being by typing messages into their BBC Micro. The being replied with some information showing himself to be from the year 1546. But this message also contains some cracks, which just confuses things further. Ken's friend Peter suggests that maybe they are being haunted by a poltergeist, and that living on the Earth's ley lines is the cause. Another night and the being replies again, revealing his last message was a test. But your lies frighten me. You said you're alive, but this is not so. If you were alive, you would say you know not of Jesus College. My college was Brazenose, from whence I was expelled for not deleting the Pope's name. If you don't explain your ignorance to me, then I must make an end to my words with you. This would cause me much despair. Lucas. We didn't challenge him about Jesus College. He was testing us. Soon after this, Debbie begins to have visions of a man in oldie worldy clothes. After searching a library and finding nothing on him, Lucas once again sends another message telling our hapless couple that the name Lucas is merely an alias to protect his safety. This same message also reveals that Lucas, or Thomas as his real name is revealed to be, has also been talking to someone from the year 2109, who were responsible for dropping off his box of lights to which he uses to send these messages. He says, you say you're from 1985. I thought you were from... 2109, like your friend who bought me my box of lights. 2109? Dear God, you mean he's getting messages from our future? That seems to be what it means. Peter, send them a message. Next week we'll have the concluding part of Ken and Debbie's computer mystery. This is where the first episode of the show left us hanging. I never caught the next part as I was a busy kid and Resident Evil wasn't going to complete itself. Chris Redfield. Anyways, luckily for us, 22 years later we can reveal the ending to this spooky tale as YouTuber VHS Video Vault has uploaded the following parts. So let us continue. 
Ken and Debbie decide to get in some ghost bros to investigate, but they come up with nothing. A few moments later, the beings from 2109 get in contact, and for some reason Ken and Debbie decide that rather than read the whole message from a ghostly otherworldly being from the future, they would much rather just go to the pub or something. Anyways, the 2109 users describe themselves as perfect beings and composed entirely of tachyons, and that they are in need of Ken and Debbie for an experiment. The nature of the experiment isn't covered, but Ken ain't happy. We've got a computer that's doing Star Trek impressions. I don't believe in destiny and all that crap. It makes a kind of sense. We are Thomas's future, they're our future. They? Who are they? After doing some more searching, Peter digs up more info on the past users. Turns out the last message they received from him was actually from the sheriff who plans to execute Thomas because of his box of lights. However, being from the future, Ken decides that they can save Thomas by threatening to reveal the sheriff's plan to take down the king. Then I shall free Lucas within the hour. Peter did it! It worked! I beg your forgiveness, but I meant him no harm. This works and Thomas is freed. However, the users from 2109 are seemingly not happy and the poltergeist activity in Ken and Debbie's home increases and this in turn leads to Debbie having another vision of Thomas. The beings from 2109 then tell Ken that they are cutting communication with Thomas, so the couple are left with no other option but to bring the ghost bros back in to finally get to the bottom of this mystery. This again goes nowhere really as the ghost bros ask the beings questions which they answer but the ghost bros are still not happy and decide to try and up the ante with a question that at current cannot be answered. John's asked us to ask them another question. The solution to Fermat's last theorem. What's that? It's a complicated mathematical puzzle. Never been solved. The beings from 2109 challenge the Ghost Bros confidence and they relent. We wonder how much David would like the answer to his question if he knew the consequences. We know your deepest fear. Before we tell you, do you swear to grant us a wish? And I wrote that back. If it be in our power so to do, and that we do not lose our bodies, minds, and souls to you. Is that it? Did you drag us down here for this? Then let the man who is willing to lose these step forward. This then leads to Debbie and Ken moving out of their home and never looking back. Experts on linguistics of the time are brought in to share their thoughts. So do you think it's a sophisticated hoax by somebody who has a background in modern English? No, if somebody had a background in early modern English writings, they would do, they would, their hoax would look a lot better than this. I mean, they would get their verbal inflections correct. They wouldn't choose vocabulary that came from a period long before the period that this is supposed to have been written in. Um, they'd do it a lot better. And finally, the ghost bros are interviewed off camera. Richard also spoke to the two investigators from the Society for Psychical Research who chose not to appear on camera. They too thought it was a hoax, but had no idea how it was done. 